we must get up, we must work like maniacs because time is running out. Could free and fair elections soon be a thing of the past? That's one of the burning questions brought on by the rise of social media, whose algorithms have been used to obscure the truth and amplify the lies during election campaigns all over the world. This is Nobel Prize Conversations, and you just heard Maria Ressa, the 2021 Peace Laureate. Ressa is an American Filipino journalist, and she was awarded the prize together with her Russian colleague, Dmitry Muratov, for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. Maria Ressa is one of the founders of Rappler, an independent website for investigative journalism in the Philippines. In 2016, Rappler sounded the alarm on the social media revolution. Two years later, Facebook admitted responsibility for letting their platform be used as a weapon in the genocide of the Rohingyas of Myanmar. There's a point when that kind of making money becomes evil. And I believe that point is when you know that what you're creating is killing people. Your host is Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. This podcast was produced in cooperation with Fundación Ramón Arezas. You'll hear Maria Ressa talk passionately about how authoritarians exploit social media to unravel democracy, what needs to be done to fight this, and when she thinks the damage might become irreversible. But the conversation starts off with Maria and Adam contemplating the state of democracy in her native Philippines, where history is repeating itself. My life has always been crazy, but like this time period is just insanity. I know, who would have imagined it? I mean, you're now a few weeks into the presidency of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. And 36 years ago, when the Marcos family was removed from power in the Philippines, you began your career as a journalist. Could you ever have imagined that we'd find ourselves in a world like this? No. Real life is stranger than fiction right now. I mean, you know, one of the headlines on Rappler two nights ago is is like a back to the future where Ferdinand Marcos had actually uh, appointed the grandson who was a junior. The headline was just indicative of, you know, the times we were living in. Another Ferdinand Marcos appoints another Conrado Estrella Agrarian Reform Secretary. So, The father of Ferdinand Marcos had appointed the grandfather of Conrado Estrella as agrarian reform chief many moons ago. You can't make this up. And if you did make it up as a work of fiction, your editor would edit it out. You know, it is history repeating itself, my lord. It's truly back to the future. I mean, you know, you go look at the past. And I kind of said this this is the problem that we're facing now when, when you don't have integrity of facts, right? How will you have integrity of elections is now going to be determining not just our future, but also our past. I can't imagine that this President Marcos will run after the hidden wealth of the first President Marcos, his father, right? I mean, I hope he proves me wrong and, you know, it becomes a pleasant surprise or that we would continue to have a holiday for people power 36 years ago, which deposed ousted the Marcos uh, dictator and, and chased the Marcos family to Hawaii. So how have people forgotten? Because, for instance, the money. People were very keen on getting the money back. And there are still lots of people, of course, who are. But how have the majority seemed to let that slip? Death by a thousand cuts. You know, I've used that phrase, you know, death by a thousand cuts was actually part of the rallying cry of terrorism, of terrorists. That's how I first ran into this. You know, it's uh, Al-Qaeda. Maria Ressa spent much of her youth in the United States and studied English at Princeton University before training as a journalist in the Philippines. For many years, she was one of Southeast Asia's most well-known war correspondents and an outspoken witness to the growth of terrorism in the region. But with Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, she began to see a different and more insidious threat to global democracy, information warfare through social media. 
became a journalist because I knew information is power. And I think that we've forgotten that you change reality by changing what people think. So what happened here is, you know, Russian information warfare created dual realities in the Ukraine, in Crimea. And that was, what, 2014? So eight years later, the same meta narratives that were seeded in 2014 are used by Putin to invade Ukraine. So it's a two-step process, and it's the same whether it's in the Philippines, Ukraine, the United States, you know, name it. You suppress and then you replace. That's what's happened. And then you create these dual realities. So not, now fast forward, let me answer your question. What an around the world way of me getting to it. How can Marcos Jr. become president again? Because from 2014, not coincidentally, the same time as Russian disinformation was working on the annexation of Crimea, around that time period, pro-Marcos accounts began seeding on social media, YouTube, Facebook. Twitter is the one where they didn't succeed, but YouTube was seeding and then Facebook for distribution. That was when historical revisionism happened, began. And you have to say, you know, these social media platforms, they knew, they were warned as early as 2014, the impact, their algorithmic amplification, their business model was having globally on democracy, on reality. It kind of makes sense, right? This is real-time behavior modification, A-B testing on real people. And what do you get? Like, we're just Pavlov's dogs. Whatever works best then is used to keep us on site. Well, That business model now has killed democracy in many parts of the world, recreating reality. So here we are, right? There were really Filipinos who believed that if they voted for Ferdinand Marcos Jr., that he would bring back the Taliana gold. This is something seated on YouTube, distributed on Facebook, that he would bring back gold and they would get gold. They actually think that they're going to profit from his election. It speaks to an incredible degree of sophistication by the Marcos campaign and all the people who've helped it in seeding this over an eight-year period. People really do understand how to manipulate these platforms that are already manipulative by their nature. Yeah, I live on social media. Uh, Rappler, the company that I co-founded, We drank the Kool-Aid. We believed that social media, that this technology could help jumpstart development in the global south, in countries like the Philippines. And we helped bring Facebook to other parts of the Philippines, right? We ran workshops that the name of the workshops were social media for social change. And that's part of the reason that we saw the shift. By 2016, you began to see the political dominoes begin to fall. It started first in the Philippines with the election of Rodrigo Duterte in May 2016. A little more than a month later, it was Brexit. Then you had all the elections come up, you know, Catalonia, Donald Trump, you had Jair Bolsonaro, you name it, right? So this is part of the problem. That was in 2016. This is 2022. And what we are seeing, and I'm going to use Ann Applebaum's phrase, autocracy Inc., is gaining ground because authoritarian leaders using social media are getting elected democratically. And then once they're elected democratically, they use the democratically given powers they've gotten, and they crumble democracy from within. The more of these digital authoritarians are elected, the greater the geopolitical changes will shift. When the Arab Spring was going on and people were raving about social media's ability to connect for good, it was then apparent that what was on offer was an incredibly powerful technology. If you compare it with something like biotech, when the biotech revolution happened, those who were developing biotech realized that there was something very powerful happening and they got together the Asilomar conferences to talk about regulation. Yeah. And that was successful. Why didn't something similar happen with the growth of social media? How has it been able to get out of hand in this way? 
I think there are three reasons, right? I think the first is that the technology happened really under wraps. And the people who developed the technology wanted to keep it under wraps. They may have known the dangers, but it didn't seem to matter. Because until today, this continues with impunity. So the first is the tech builders themselves. The second are the governments that should have protected their citizens against this, right? So the tech, I believe at a certain point, they understood what they were doing. And then lobbying money went out. Government officials tended not to understand the tech. It took a while. I would say Cambridge Analytica 2018 was probably the first time. We started ringing the alarm bells in 2016. It was truly shocking. It was a world turned upside down on the internet. It was drastic. And I would peg it. So 2015, when Facebook began instant articles. What's instant articles? It's news. They tried to get news organizations to join Facebook, but they didn't change the algorithms. So these algorithms actually give preferential treatment for distribution to lies, right? Journalism is kind of boring compared to the most salacious gossip you can hear or the lie, the conspiracy theory, right? The lie is a better commercial prospect for them. Not just commercial, but truly it grabs hold of people and keeps them scrolling. Because if you take a look at the end goal for the platforms, it's money. It's truly just a business model, right? But that business model has not just insidiously manipulated our human emotions, our biology. It has, in the process, weakened our democracy to the point that they're broken, divided our societies, and radicalized people all around the world, right? So these are harms that are now properly documented in 2022. Sorry, so let me get back to your question. So the two groups abdicated responsibility. Journalists were the gatekeepers. We were replaced around 2014, 2015 by technology. Tech abdicated responsibility for protecting the public sphere. And the other group that should have protected the public sphere are governments, democratic governments. I mean, we had GDPR, which was wrong because we couldn't make the shift from content to algorithms, to data and models, right? So most of the public discussion, even until today, centers around content moderation. And I got to say, the platform's like it that way. That is why Facebook, for example, has created an oversight board, what it calls a Supreme Court for content. Never the problem. You know, content was never the problem. So why do you have a Supreme Court that moves at a snail's pace compared to like the exponential spread of content, right? So you got to move upstream from the content to the algorithmic amplification. That's the black box that operates the information ecosystem. Those algorithms, what do they use to decide whom to distribute to? You go further upstream to the mother load. That's the data, our personal data in a a system called surveillance capitalism. Shoshana Zuboff wrote it like a 750-page book explaining this. She didn't write that book till 2019, mind you, right? All of this is coming out. And I think the key part here is to realize, I think it took everyone, lawmakers, the people who could have done something, a long time to realize that every single app you have is gathering your personal thoughts, right? Because machine learning builds a model based on that atomized post, all of the tens of thousands that you may have used this cell phone for. And then once it has a model of you, like think about it as cloning you, (laughs) right? This is your personal life. It is your essence in numbers. So that model, that clone then is picked up by artificial intelligence and then brought to the surveillance capital. That data, the platforms say they own, right? Hmm. Are they allowed to do that? These are very basic questions. And now you talk about like, this is also where all of the types of laws that are discussed separately, data privacy, antitrust, user safety, content moderation being the least. That's where we should be talking. And finally, you know, just in spring of next year, that's going to be where the first laws, this is the EU that's crafted this law, the Digital Services Act, Digital Market Act. These are the laws that will try to address the algorithms of amplification 
not yet the business model. I think the other part is, you know, not only do you want these companies who are now the largest in scope, right? Fastest growing, even during the pandemic, they continued to grow at the expense of real people and our democracies. I'm writing a book right now and I'm really contemplating this. How could the people who do this, the people who built the tech, right? In some of the quotes, Mark Zuckerberg is quoted as saying, you know, company over country. And shareholders, American shareholders say that's great because he delivered, Sheryl Sandberg delivered for these shareholders. But there's a point when that kind of making money becomes evil. And I believe that point is when you know that what you're creating is killing people. And we passed that point in 2018 with genocide in Myanmar, right? And so many more. I mean, Silicon Valley since came home to roost on Capitol Hill. And they know the dangers to their own democracy. The polarization in the United States is off the scale. The dystopian future that you've just described, which is our current reality, are we too far behind the curve to stop it? Do you think that there can be the creation of laws to make things different? I mean, obviously one has to be hopeful, but things are moving so fast. You know, this is how fast I think it's moving. I think in the next two years, it may be irreversible. In the Nobel lecture, I talked about integrity of elections. And I actually said, you can't have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts. And the biggest problem we have right now is that we don't agree on the facts. And that is by design of the platforms. If you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without any of these, you have no shared space, no shared reality, no democracy, right? And I have said those sentences repeatedly for the last six years, right? So I feel like Cassandra and Sisyphus combined (laughs) in this, Um, you know, but this year there are 32 elections globally. You know what happened to us. Kenya will have elections in August. Kenya is critical in Africa. Brazil will have elections in October. The United States will have elections in November. Next year, you have Poland and India, right? These are just some. I mean, I can name so many more. And in every country around the world where elections will happen, these information operations against their citizens are happening because there is now a nervous system globally, just like Al-Qaeda, where for the 9-11 attacks, Al-Qaeda hijacked homegrown groups for its jihad against the West. Well, this is the same thing. And the world is turning fascist. I mean, in the United States, look at the white replacement theory. Like that sounds so ominous, but this whole idea of us against them, this was the basis of, of Hitler, of Stalin. Here we are again. And look, I sound so negative. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> well, you know, you sound like you're fighting a war. We've woken up in a place that we couldn't have imagined ourselves in. And yet it is all around us and it has become the dominant reality. It's so peculiar. So how do you solve this, right? This is what I've spent the last three years really thinking about because we are in the front lines, right? Like whether I go to jail or not will be determined by this context. It's not something that is academic for me. And the way I think about this is stop with downstream, move upstream. What is the core problem? You know, I'm much more adamant today than I was six years ago. Um, (laughs) I was very calm six years ago. (laughs) Now it's just alarming. And how do you do that? I think of three pillars for how we do this, because again, this is manipulation of our minds in our information ecosystem. It's technology, journalism, and community. We've gone through an election and what we did, we didn't sit here and like throw up our hands because there's still no law and the platforms haven't really done much. What we did is we tried to figure out what civic engagement, how can we get a whole of society approach 
to protect the facts, to protect the truth, to protect history. And that's not just a journalist's job. So those three, tech, journalism, community, the tech is critical, put guardrails around them, and we're building tech in Rappler. That tech was rolled out just in time for elections, probably not with enough time before. The second is journalism needs to survive. So despite all of the attacks against us, the infinite attacks online and the legal attacks offline, the real costs of these things, despite that, we keep going because this time matters. The third pillar is what about communities, right? All those people who believed stop the steal, they don't go away. That's called rehabilitation, right? When you begin to believe the lie, cognitive bias kicks in. It gets worse, right? Social media is addictive. It was designed to be addictive. And when you change your worldview, that becomes a whole other process. But so what we did with our community is, look, the elevator pitch of Rappler when we started in 2012 was we build communities of action and the food we feed our communities is journalism. So what we did for these last elections was to actually engage. We did a pyramid, like a four-layer pyramid where news organizations and fact-checking was the first layer. The second layer, we called it the mesh. This is our civil society, NGOs, human rights groups, environmental groups, the church, business groups, Filipinos who care about facts, who will share fact checks, which never get any distribution, who will share it with emotion because emotions get distribution. Hmm. That's the second layer. The third layer were our researchers. We released data. We shared data. We collaborated. There were seven research groups. And every week from February to May 9th, which is when our elections was, there was a new research report released every week that would tell Filipinos how they were being manipulated, who was benefiting, who was under attack. And inevitably, all the attacks were focused on the opposition leader, Lenny Robredo, the vice president, who is outgoing now, and who benefited Ferdinand Marcos Jr., right? So you can see this. We mapped, Rappler mapped the networks of disinformation. And finally, the fourth layer is the law. All these legal groups who have been so quiet for six years while rule of law was bent and broken, well, now they came up and they are far more passionate than the really exhausted journalists at the bottom of the pyramid. (laughs) At the top of the pyramid, the lawyers from left, right, and center, they came together and they did litigation. They released tactical litigation to protect voters, to protect the journalists, to protect anyone who was under attack, and strategic litigation to try to protect the information ecosystem, to try to protect elections. Obviously, it wasn't enough. But that's the kind of solution we need until legislation kicks in. So you asked, is this enough? Well, look, like I've had to live with this for a long time. So I can tell you short, medium, and long term. Long term, it's education. Medium term, it's laws. Short term, it's all of us combined. It's a whole of society approach. It's activists who will force the shareholders of these companies to actually care, to have enlightened self-interest, to realize that they cannot destroy democracy, even though they're making buttloads of money, that when they do that, that ultimately this will come back to them. I hope. (laughs) All I can do is hope, right? Exhausted journalists. The one person who doesn't sound like an exhausted journalist is you. You have such passion. What keeps you going? How do you, as you hinted at there, you face real and present danger. You have, is it seven court cases against you at once? Every time you travel out of the country, you need to get permission from seven different judges to move. The threat of going to prison is very real. How do you keep your courage with all of that in the background? You know, I don't think about it as courage. I think the reason why I keep going and I'm really excited is because this is truly creative destruction. The world that we knew has been destroyed. It's already been destroyed in our minds. And so we are like zombies creating the new world right now. And if we're not fully aware of both 
the technology that is insidiously manipulating us, the forces, the context of what we're living through, then we cannot create the world we want. There's an opportunity. The opportunity is that we can actually create a better world. And we may be able to, I guess that's why. So this is part of it, right? Like being in Rappler, you know, we've had to pivot so many times. That's partly exciting because you have to figure out whether that works. But now it's like the entire world. It is both horrifying and uh, it's not exciting in the way that I think about it. It's just you have no choice. We must get up. We must work like maniacs because time is running out. I know you talk about the honor code that you learned in Princeton. How much does that play a part? Because sometimes listening to you, it sounds like, and I don't want to trivialize it, but if you like the thrill of the challenge, the thrill of the startup, the enormity of the task is a driving force. And sometimes it's the need to do good, the need to battle what you see as wrong. Tell me, can you disentangle all those things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I did in the book. I have a draft. <laughs> <laughs> so this um, is how to stand up to a dictator. It is, because in the end, how do you stand up to a dictator? You better know your values. And then you better know the lines that you won't cross. And then you figure out how do you then get scale, right? So I think you have to know the fundamental to my identity is a journalism. I learned the world through that context. Before I became a journalist, it was about very simple values, honesty. I think learning how to be honest to yourself is the toughest, you know. So the personal values are really simple. It's honesty. It is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then the third that I use is the honor code. You pledge that you're not going to cheat, that you pledge on your honor that not only will you not be corrupt, but that you would also report anyone else who is. That in your area of influence, you are responsible for the world you're creating. I like that. Those are the three. I actually like kind of distilled it down. And, you know, I was like, okay, these three drive me. But in the context of journalism, I became a journalist because I believe information is power. And justice comes from that. That's the way I reported in country after country after country. And when you're doing television and breaking news, this is probably the best training I could have gotten for Duterte, which is, you know, tens of thousands of live shots over my career where you're standing in the middle and people are shooting behind you, but you have to sit there and in three points in a minute and a half or two minutes at most, you summarize 450 pages, you know, 450 years of history, which is East Timor and colonialism. And then you say what's going on within that context, right? This is great fun. Yes, I love journalism, but, you know, the best part is there's the mission of journalism. And that's the last part. I think it's, you know, so I talked about values. I talked about journalism and its mission. But that mission, that creates the societies, right? I've worked in Southeast Asia all my career. And um, I've always said this, even after the fall of Suharto, after almost 32 years in power, the quality of a democracy is almost directly linked to the quality of its journalists. Hmm. And the hard part right now is that the distribution system that we all live in, and it's not just journalism, that distribution system is being used to attack not just the facts, but the journalists themselves. So many Nobel laureates talk about the fact that their path is a lonely one, that people don't believe them, whether they're doing science or what you're doing. You're working in isolation with your beliefs. I mean, OK, you're trying to convert people to your cause. You're talking everywhere and many, 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 many people around the world support you. But it's still, I imagine, a very lonely quest. I have three co-founders in Rappler, three women roughly my age, you know, and Rappler couldn't have survived if I was alone. And I have Rappler. This is also the other difference, right? Rappler is about 100 to 120 people. 
It's a company that's now a decade old, more than a decade old. Our website is a decade old now. And this is the reason why like, people keep asking me, why do you keep coming back to the Philippines? And this is why I also go to the courts and I say, ridiculous people, I actually have come back to the Philippines. You know, from the end of 2018, December 2018, until March 2020, when the lockdown began, I had to ask for permission 36 times. And I came home every single time. And, and that question is, why do you come home? Because I'm not just one reporter. I have this incredible company that is now incredibly mission-driven, people who also take risks, people who also are under attack. And it's 63% women with a median age at 23 years old, right? It's very young. So good God, right? In that sense, I'm lucky. And actually, if I think about it, under the Duterte administration, 66 lawyers were killed, 22 journalists were killed. So more lawyers, the ones defending us, were killed than journalists. We haven't knock on, you know, we haven't had to deal with these types of losses, but I've prepared for these things. And don't ask me how I prepare. (laughs) Um, But, you know, If you're a Rappler, you know it's self-selecting. And uh, in 2018, when the government tried to revoke our license to operate, I actually held the General Assembly, which is like a full team meeting. And I asked everybody to like, because I knew we were entering a new place and time. It was like, if you don't want to stay, let us know. We will help place you somewhere else. No one in editorial, no reporter, no journalist opted out. What this has done is our mission, our purpose for being, we're, we're very clear. And I think I said this as early as 2016, you know, what I want to do is when I look back a decade from now, I want to know I did everything I could. Talk about building community. What a community at Rappler. We, the founders, the four of us, it's Glenda Gloria, Chai Hofilenia, Beth Frondoso, and myself. The four of us are like in our late 50s now. Our kids, (laughs) they're really our kids. Um, (laughs) Our reporters are really young, between 25 and 30. I think the eldest may be 35, right? Because we're now a decade old. So when we get exhausted, and it is exhausting, they give us energy. And when they get lost or tired, we give them energy. So it's um, this goes back to the attention economy and what holds us together, right? I think part of what holds Rappler together and gives us this, this incredible like will, I think, is we know this time is important. This time matters. We happen to be the person shooting that shot in the last seconds of the game. And this goes back to the attention economy. I think every single person is searching for meaning. We're driven by meaning in Rappler. But every single person, you know, you, you're coming of age, every task you do, you're looking for why. That's the question. Why do you do what you do? And what I hate the most is that this attention economy is sucking away the why hmm. because it is luring young kids on the platform and giving them nothing in return. It's a time suck. It is keeping them scrolling, giving the platforms more money, but taking away the time that this person, this young person needs. And I think this is the last part, right? The attention economy uses our emotions, yes. But what does it do? All of the things that keep you scrolling the most is connected to moral outrage. Hmm. That's what keeps you scrolling the most, moral outrage. And moral outrage turns to mob rule, which is the reason why online violence is real world violence. Sorry, I can talk, you know, it's just, these are things I've thought about for a long time. We have the data. (laughs) (laughs) You have the data, it's important, and you need people to step up. At the end of your Nobel lecture, You ask people to close their eyes and imagine the world as it should be. When you close your eyes, what do you imagine? Oh, my gosh. Uh, A meritocracy, 
So anything from our democracies with complete checks and balances where freedom of speech is not being stifled by pounding someone exponentially, strong democratic institutions, rule of law, a world that's more inclusive, a world that realizes if we don't do enough about climate change, we will die anyway. You know, I mean, climate, these poor climate stories are never going to get the distribution they need on social media, right? Turn these things so that climate change stories get wider distribution. That would be a service to humanity. And actually, we've taken many, many steps back in terms of gender, gender equality, because what social media has done is it's encouraged the rise of both sexism and misogyny, gender disinformation. I've never seen it at this scale. I'm a victim of this as well, right? So I speak from firsthand experience. It's crazy. It feels like in order to give these profits to these tech companies, we all have sacrificed our future. And that should not be. Okay, so, you know, I think that's one. But the other one is the impunity that governments are also getting away with. You know, so in a strange way, when Russia got away with impunity in annexing Crimea, eight years later, the technology was better. The realities were more splintered and Putin went ahead and invaded Ukraine, right? The world needs to come to a decision of how much do we watch? But the upside of this is at least... The democratic world, what remains of the free world, acted together. But now, with more time, what are we going to do? This goes back again to those values. What are our values? It's really heartbreaking. When I was in Norway, I spent time with a woman who had just left Kiev for the first time since the war began. And we were in Utøya in that island that Anders Breivik, the Norwegian, killed 77 people, mass shooting in 2011, that early. That mass shooting inspired Christchurch, which inspired Buffalo. So this is like a direct line all the way through. Buffalo just happened a little while ago. And Buffalo was directly connected to me because I came into the U.S. almost right after that to go to my high school where I graduated. And the Buffalo shooter had actually mentioned my town, Tom's River, in the us against them. Why? Because we had a Hasidic Jew community that that shooter was demonizing. So this continues, this virus, and it is turning us against each other. Sorry, I've been thinking a lot. Can you tell? (laughs) Now you mention it. (laughs) (laughs) Do you ever stop thinking? Do you ever just chill out? Can't imagine it, really. Yes, I try, but the world doesn't allow me that much free time. You know, it's really painful. I want to read. I want to sleep. These are things that we don't get a chance to do that much. It's inspirational and um, worrying to speak to you in equal measure. Thank you very much indeed, Maria. Thanks. Bye-bye. You just heard Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about Maria Ressa, you can go to nobelprize.org, where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for this episode was Cardin Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, Magnus Yulier, and me, Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. If you're looking for more listening, check out our earlier conversation with Liberian activist Lema Bowie, another peace laureate with an unbreakable spirit. You can find previous seasons and conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>